Very good. Good morning. Um, so one, it's an absolute thrill to be here. I have the I have the privilege of representing Gulfstream Aerospace on the board of the Creative Coast, and. I will tell you, for the last 48 hours, everyone that I've talked with, I've gone, you don't understand, I've had the opportunity to spend time with Dr. Neil Gershenfeld. And, it, you know, and so the guys at Starbucks have gotten a little tired of it. But it, let me share with you, there's kind of two things I want to share with you. One, uh, you know, I want to give you the bio and give you some idea of who Mr. Dr. Neil Gershenfeld is, because no kidding, we really are in the presence of an amazing individual. Uh, but the story is actually even a little bit more interesting is initially I reached out to him to talk to Geekin and you know just to give you an idea he normally speaks at TEDx the White House Davos I triple some you know spectrum photography some you know stuff like that and so I didn't really get a great response not in a bad way it's just this is a gentleman who's all, all on his own here's what's even cooler though then he was like well what about Gulfstream not sure I can pull something off there because you know I'm in HR, so I barely see, I can spell the fact barely spell the fact that we have planes, right? So you know I was like you know maybe maybe don't, but then a third variable kicked in. Dad, it turns out he has an amazing son that is also interested in art and learning about the schools, and so the reason I share this story is that it's exactly what this conference is about: is that Dr. Neil Gershenfeld is not here because of one conference. He's not here because of Gulfstream. He's not here because of SCAD. He's here because this community is starting to become incredibly vibrant, right? And it's that community of technology and creativism and, and entrepreneurism that is able to attract people of this town. Uh, and so I just want to applaud you all because the reason this is happening is because of you. So first and foremost, thank you. Second, let me, now you're going, okay, who is this guy, right? So let me talk to you a little bit about Dr. Neil Gershenfeld. Dr. Neil Gershenfeld is the director of the Center of Bits and Atoms at MIT. Uh, and I'll candidly tell you that the more I started researching what he does, the less I understood what he does. Uh, but just to give you an idea, so, you know, so one, he's got his you know, bachelor's degree in physics from Swarthmore. He's got his PhD in applied physics from Cornell University. He's a junior fellow at Harvard, right? Obviously runs a laboratory at MIT. But you may still go, okay, I don't know what that means, right? So let me give you some other things that really kind of help put it in context of uh, the gentleman that we're going to be hearing from. One, when Maker Ed Magazine came out, the very first edition, he was the first interview. So just to give you an idea. But it goes even further. Scientific American Magazine has listed him as one of the top 50 intellectuals in the world today. The Museum of Science and Industry has listed him as one of the top living Leonardo da Vinci's. Popular Mechanics has listed him as one of the Foreign policy has listed him as one of the top 100 public intellectuals in the world. So it is truly with my pleasure and, you know, and just, and again, thank you, and the honor of being able to present this to you, Dr. Neil Gershenfeld. Thanks, Franz. And the intro is accurate. I just, my schedule is difficult. And so it's hard just to come talk. But we've been doing a lot of work in aerospace. And there was this interesting Gulfstream connection. And my son in high school was doing CG modeling for Harvard's Egyptologist to reconstruct Giza. And where do you go to school next after that? And then working with Hollywood art directors and SCAD popped up. And it's the intersection of them that leads to being here. Uh, so I want to talk about the future of making things. Uh, at MIT, I teach a class called How to Make Almost Anything. And this was aimed at a few research students. And every year, hundreds of students come trying to take it. And I was consistently amazed by what they did. So the first year I taught it, Skelly, Kelly was a sculptor with no technical background. They do semester projects integrating what they learned. And this was her project. Hi, I'm Kelly. And this is my screen body. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work, or you're in a classroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of situations where it's just not permitted? Well, Screen Body is a portable space for screaming. When a user screams into Screen Body, their scream is silenced, but it is also recorded for later release, where, when, and how the user chooses. 
and go into the main up to the second floor. Um, this is a web browser for parrots. Parrots have the cognitive ability of a two-year-old child that go crazy left home alone. Um, this is an alarm clock you wrestle with and convince it that you're awake. Um, this is a dress instrumented with sensors and spines that defends your personal space if somebody comes too close. And in fact, uh, Kelly is now head of the digital media department at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, Meejin, who did this, is now head of architecture at MIT. The students doing this have gone on to amazing things. And this happened so consistently year after year, I realized the students were answering a question I hadn't asked, which is, what is digital fabrication good for? So this is Ken Olson, head of digital equipment. Uh, MIT developed the first transistorized computers, the TX series. They were commercialized as the PDP series by DEC. PDPs were used to create the internet. This is Ken Olson, the head of DEC, famously saying, nobody needs a computer at home. Uh, Route 128 outside Boston was Wang, Prime, Data General, DEC, the whole computer industry, every single one of them failed. Just you know, the organizational change lesson is give up. It didn't matter. <laughs> they were all doomed. Um, they all looked at PCs as toys. And PC, you have PCs, and, and they're gone. And what the students were showing is the killer app for digital fabrication is personal fabrication, which is a moment akin to the birth of personal computing that really changes everything. But this time, it's even bigger because we're programming physical reality. So you've no doubt seen all of the attention about 3D printing. As background to this talk, uh, I dislike 3D printing, and it's wildly oversold and is a distraction. Um, uh, 3D printing dates back to the 80s. Chuck Hall invented stereolithography. It's gotten a bit faster, better, and cheaper, but not that much different. Go back further, and uh, MIT made the first numerically controlled milling machine in 1952. This was an offshoot of uh, Whirlwind Computer Project Sage. This was a, an early air defense computer, and they realized it was one of the first computers that could respond in real time. So you could connect it to a machine, and it could turn knobs and make uh, aircraft parts. Um, and the job was making aircraft parts that were too hard for a machinist to do by turning the cranks. So that's 1952. Uh, what was going on at that time was Claude Shannon was at MIT writing the best master's thesis ever. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it. In Claude Shannon's master's thesis, he invents digital. There's a lot of history to it that he, he very generously and thoroughly credits. But the heart of what he showed, went on to show, is what's called a threshold theorem. So digital, the, the word has associations. This meeting maybe largely is about digital, but what does it mean? The real heart of the meaning from Shannon is what's called a threshold theorem, which is I can send you this talk as the waveforms of my voice, or I could send it to you in symbols in a code, if I send it to you in a code for a linear increase in the size of the code, there's an exponential reduction in the error rate. And that trade-off between a linear increase in the code and an exponential error reduction is why we're digital. There's very few exponentials in engineering. That trade-off is why, why we use digital, not analog. So that's what Claude Shannon did for communication. Von Neumann did it for computing, and he did it by essentially applying Shannon to a computer. Um, before Shannon, phone calls got worse with distance. Before Von Neumann, computers got worse with time. They were gears and pulleys, and your answer got worse the longer it ran. And he showed you can detect and correct errors in computing. So that's why we have digital computers. 
the first NC mill came from Norbert Wiener's servo mechanism lab, but that doesn't really fit here because the design was digital, but the machine's not. It's metal whack whacking away at metal. Um, the real insight that excites me is this one. Uh, not 1952, but four billion years ago. Uh, four billion years is the evolutionary age of the ribosome. The ribosome is my favorite uh, machine. It's the protein that makes proteins. And the ribosome does everything Shannon taught us. So um, a messenger comes in in a messenger RNA, and it's a code in exactly the sense of a modern code. Um, uh, transfer RNAs bring in amino acids, molecular building blocks, and then they get assembled to build the muscles moving my arms and the light sensors in my eyes as molecular machinery. Now, if you mix chemicals, a yield of a part per hundred is good. The ribosome has an error rate of a part in 10 to the 4, and when you replicate DNA, there's extra error correction, and so the error rate is a part in 10 to the 8. That's the exponential of being digital, and that's what makes life possible. So that's digital fabrication. Now, fast forward. Um, there's maybe 20 descendants of the 1952 milling machine. There's laser cutters and EDMs and water jets, and now um, fused deposition molding and laser sinter and stereolithography. Um, compare all of them to one of my favorite processes, the kid with the Lego bricks. You don't need a ruler to place Lego bricks. The geometry comes from the bricks, so the child can make something bigger than themselves. Um, visiting Gulfstream yesterday, the machines they use to make the airplanes are these giant, incredibly expensive machines that have to be extremely stiff to maintain coordinates because the coordinate comes from the machine not the parts that it's assembling. Um, with the Lego bricks, the tower is more accurate than the child because you can detect and correct errors. Um, when you make the airplane, you have to measure everything very carefully because there's no information in the materials. Um, when you're done with the airplane, there's not much you can do with it. With the Lego bricks, you take them apart and use them again because there's state in the materials. And again, all of those are exactly the lessons from Shannon and von Neumann, but now applied to fabrication. So there's a casual sense of digital fabrication, which is I send you a file and it becomes a thing. And that actually dates back to the 50s. And then there's this much deeper sense of you actually put information into the materials themselves. So um, this is a meeting I ran with the White House last year and a number of government agencies, and I did it out of irritation because all these government agencies wanted to talk about their 3D printing projects. And so I offered to put together the best people doing this much deeper science, this emerging science of making things. And coming out of that is this roadmap from computers controlling machines to machines that make machines, and then putting codes and finally programs into materials. So I'm going to talk a bit about the research and then about the very unexpected uh, implications of the research. So one step in is rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines. Um, these are machines my students have made. This one, for example, um, is uh, a complete fab facility in a TSA carry-on briefcase. It's a kinematically mounted gantry, and you can change the head to mill or cut or um, print. Um, then what's interesting is not the machine, but what makes it easy to do rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines, so the machine is as flexible as the project. Then next step in is that's a fixed function machine. Um, this is a machine now where the, um, uh, the construction of the machine is modular hardware, and it's mirrored in modular software. So in this case, they wanted to make a hot wire cutter to make airfoil. So you assemble some degrees of freedom, and there's no state in the machine. It's just a network. 
and then you plug together some software modules, and the software modules talk to the hardware modules, and in this case, you, 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 you throw together a hot wire cutter. Um, and that was actually for serious wind tunnel tests of work I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Um, and so the machines become as flexible as um, the projects with the machines. And to do that, we had to really kind of rip up and do a complete do-over of engineering workflows. The way it's done today, again, at a place like Gulfstream, is you sit at a computer and design something, and then begins a really bad party game. You, you, you take your design, transfer it to a geometry engine. The geometry engine models the geometry with a bunch of historical assumptions that, in retrospect, were wrong. The geometry goes to something that plans a path to make it. Um, that gets exported to something that communicates it to something that controls a machine that then exports it to communicate to something that talks to something that actually moves. And so there's about six exports from your design to the thing you're controlling. Each one of those exists as a different historical industry and is enshrined uh, uh, today in, you know, when you use a 3D printer or a laser cutter, you're persisting with this bad party game. And so to do this, what you really want is the math talking directly to the motors. And so we ended up, and in discussion I can tell you more, having to write our own uh, math engines that talk to discrete path planning that then talk to real-time virtual networks. And so you have software descriptions of machines talking to stateless machines in real-time networks. And so if you go from additive to subtractive, or 2D to 3D to 4D, you physically change the degrees of freedom, and then you change the virtual machine talking to it. You really kind of have to rip up that legacy to put all these pieces together. So that's one step in. One step in is you don't buy the, the rep wrapper, the maker bot. It's the machines make the machines, based on a lot of technology for machine building. Then the second step in is more interesting. Think about the Lego bricks, but now research in the lab is, this is work we're doing to make uh, micro Lego, so Lego on micron scale. So for example, here's a 3D circuit uh, made out of micro bricks of electronic Lego. Uh, today, you know, in, in this computer, transistors go on silicon wafers that go in packages with leads, soldered to boards with traces and vias, plugged into connectors with wires and cases. Um, we want to do all of that with six parts, a conducting brick, an, uh, an insulating brick, a resistive brick, um, lightly and heavily doped NNP-type semiconductors. And the idea is by snapping them together, you can make 3D wiring. You can make inductors, capacitors, and transistors, and connectors, at, and wiring. With a single resistive brick type, you can make, um, let's see, the, yeah, this is showing with conducting and insulating bricks capacitors and inductors. You can make any resistor value with one resistor brick type, and right now we're working on the transistors, and so the goal is to do tabletop chip fab. Now, it'll be slower than high volume chip fab, but it'll be direct write. You, you can both directly build, and crucially, you, you can unbuild. We're working with NASA on doing this in space. Material in space is about worth as much as gold, but it becomes space junk or we burn it up because you can't do anything with it. The idea is if you make spacecraft out of this stuff on orbit, you can disassemble it and build something new with it. So that's discrete assembly of electronics. And then um, we found that if you apply those same ideas for aerospace, uh, um, last year we showed if you make, let's see, when Boeing makes a 787, there's a tool the size of the airplane to wind the composite barrel. There's another tool the size of the airplane to cook the composite barrel. Then there's an airplane bigger than the airplane to carry the airplane. And then there's this giant plate, you snap them all together. What we showed is instead if you make little tiny loops of carbon fiber and then you link them to make um, essentially carbon fiber Lego that looks like uh, these images, uh, 
not only can you discreetly assemble it, but it's actually an order of, of magnitude higher modulus in the extreme ultralight regime, and it has better material properties because you're creating volumes, not discrete parts. And so you can make dramatically better composites by discreetly assembling them and linking them than by having these giant tools making these giant machines. And so this, the, the airfoil I showed you was, this was a, a deforming wing we made where just by changing the loading, you can make these little carbon fiber loops and dial up lift and roll as deformation of the structure rather than control surfaces. And most interestingly, what we're doing now is making very unusual robots. So this is a robotic assembler, and all it can do is go up and down and forward and back and add or remove one loop. But just based on the ability to do that, we're working on what you can think of as airplane printers, but assemblers, where final assembly is the only assembly, and these robots crawl around assembling little carbon fiber loops to make giant airplanes. In the same way, I made one amino acid at a time by the ribosome assembling each individual amino acid. Uh, and a, a really interesting offshoot of that is we now have a program with Homeland Security on what we're calling geoprinting. Uh, Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy do tens of billions of dollars of damage, and national technical means is bags of wet sand. And so the idea is to do this now on geological scales for disaster response. So what we're finding is once you discretize the materials, you can create all of these amazing new material properties that didn't exist when you think of fabrication as cutting or printing as opposed to assembling or disassembling. Um, maybe the most important implication at this stage is this is when technical trash goes away. There's, there's no trash in a forest you die and get disassembled and reassembled. In the same sense here, when you're done with something, you break it to the constituent building blocks and reassemble them into something else. So then the step that comes after that is um, we've been developing the mathematics of programmable materials, so ways to code materials that change shape. So that now you lose the machine entirely, and the materials themselves turn into different shapes and building various kinds of robotic materials that can do that kind of reconfiguration. And that in turn leads to one of my favorite projects, which is once you're programming reconfigurable materials, you don't want to write lines of code for an ARM processor in this reconfigurable system. And so we found we had to really do what's now a do-over of computer science. So this is a fly-through of a computer program where you can zoom down to an individual transistor or up to the application. When you zoom a map, you go from city to state to country. It's hierarchical, but you don't change the map geometry. When you go from a IC to microcode to object code to a program, they don't look at all like each other. And why do we change representation in computing? Um, I'm increasingly convinced that's just a historical mistake. Software was built on a pretend world that doesn't have physics that leads to a lot of what's hard in computing. Instead, you can design a computer science where software looks like hardware. Computer science and physical science look like the same thing. So you can overlay computing with smart systems you're building them in as a way to program them. And so now if you take that quick tour and step back, you can see we're retracing history. There were mainframe computers. Then came mini computers. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs on a PDP inventing Unix. All modern computing really dates from that moment. And it was because at this point, uh, computing went from a million to $100,000, which meant a work group could have it. They could do this without being limited by corporate policy. Then came hobbyist computers. This was the Altair. And the Altair was life-changing for people like me. The Altair was the first personal computer. The killer app for it is you could flip the switches to load a binary program, and then start it, and the lights would blink. And it was life-changing, <laughs> but not yet useful. And then came the PC. The 3D printer isn't remotely a PC, because in the PC, it took the PDP, 
where there was a subsystem for graphics, a subsystem for communication, a subsystem for power, a subsystem for I.O., and put all of those systems into one box where it just looked like a single thing. And so in that sense, the personal fabricator comes when you put it all in one box. So there's the 1952 NC uh, mill. There's fab labs I'll talk about that are very similar to the PDP. There's the machines that make machines that are like the Altair. And then we get up to the Star Trek replicator. And the insight is the replicator is an exercise in embodying information in materials. The way to get there isn't better printing or cutting, it's actually programming the materials themselves. Now, what you should learn from this history is the internet was invented here, not down here. The internet came in the PDP era. Video games, word processing, all of that happened when it got down to the work group stage. You didn't have to wait 20 years, and that's where we are today. So, um, there's a natural economic parallel. The research tools I use are these million dollar machines. Uh, to do the research, we have a workshop with hundred thousand dollar machines. With those, you can make smaller versions, these ten thousand dollar machines, that are good enough to make the thousand dollar machines. And so there's a natural hierarchy in capabilities. And motivated by that, we put together for the National Science Foundation uh, fab labs that were an unexpected accident. Rosenberg opened a fab lab in Boston South End that provides free access to digital fabrication machines for local children, teens, and entrepreneurs in the community. We set up a community lab that was in between the research tools on campus and the Star Trek replicator in the future. It was maybe $50,000 worth of machines, and that was the whole project. But Gershenfeld's whole project soon got a whole lot bigger. <laughs> when MIT and the National Science Foundation were asked to set up a fab lab in Ghana. And that was just the beginning. They started doubling. There are about 200 now. They've been doubling about every year and a half. They're above the Arctic Circle in rural villages in Jalalabad in Afghanistan in shanty towns. Every time we opened one, somebody else wanted one. The labs get used for education, learning skills. They get used for creating businesses. They get used for play, they get used to make art. Then we link them globally with video and online content. Around the world, people are benefiting from these fab labs and the potential for this technology seems limitless. So in those powers of 10, this is about a 100K investment. Uh, in the fab labs, there's design tools, there's 3D printers and scanners that actually are among the least used tools. There's subtractive machining to make things like circuit boards or production tooling, uh, computer-controlled cutting with a knife, computer-controlled cutting with a laser, uh, large format machining to either directly machine things or make tooling for uh, composites, and then surface mount, rework, embedded programming, sensors and actuators, things like that. And so with all of this, you can make all of this. So, um, skateboards, uh, boats, bicycles, houses, uh, computer terminals, healthcare sensors, uh, computer, uh, consumer electronics, uh, production tooling, everything here was made with stuff here. Um, uh, and my comment about the 3D printing is these are all digital fabrication, they're all computer controlled tools. But once you have all of them, the 3D printer, maybe you use 20% of the time. There's, you know, it, it's a bit like microwave ovens. You know, the kitchen of the future, you push a button to cut, cook everything. You still have stoves and ovens, and they're useful. There's a role for the 3D printer today, um, but it's only about 20% of the functionality of a space like this. So today, you can view the fab lab as a machine. You send data to it and view this whole thing as a machine and out comes stuff. Over the next 20 years, that'll all get merged and fit in your pocket, but you don't need to wait 20 years to make this kind of stuff. So we, we set up one, and then they just started doubling. There was a Ghanaian connection to Boston, and it went to Sekundi Takaradi in the coast of Ghana. And then there was a South African connection, and it went to Pretoria, and then Soshangovi. And then a connection to India, and it went to Pabal outside Pune. And we have them now above the Arctic Circle and at the bottom of Africa. And the, about 400 now, and the doubling time is a year and a half, all with the same set of tools evolving and shared across the network. Um, this is a lab in inner city Detroit run by Blair Evans. And 
he's working with at-risk youth. He takes kids in the juvenile justice system and teenage pregnancy, brings them into the lab, and he's funding it as a social service based on delivering better life outcomes. Compared to what was being spent on social services for kids at-risk youth, He's showing them, teaching them to make stuff with the tools, provides better life outcomes, and he funds it uh, you know, on the, you know, the output of the lab is transforming lives. Uh, this is one we did with uh, Native Alaskans, Cook Inlet Tribal Council. Great, amazing cultural traditions, horrible suicide rates, alcoholism, unemployment, and so here, it's, it's taking traditional native crafts and materials and merging them with modern tools for fabrication. Uh, this is one at an arts colony in, in Maine, Haystack, which is one of the temples of traditional arts and crafts of glass making and uh, print making and um, fiber arts. And when we first brought it in, half of the artists were horrified at this intrusion of technology. The other half were horrified at the first half because all of art is technology. <laughs> And at this point, nobody can even remember that because every single art discipline uses the tools. The computer is never used as the design tool. People design in traditional media, but then use this to work in ways that they couldn't. Like this was an artist interested in the light on the main ocean, and this has turned into tooling to slump glass that sparkles like the main ocean. Or these are sketches turned into direct right intaglio printing places, plates. So it's a giant media transformation device. Um, uh, this is one at the Protestant Catholic boundary in Northern Ireland. Uh, there was post-Troubles EU funding that didn't really have good stuff to spend money on. And so this is, this is literally at the, what's called the Peace Wall, euphemistically, um, where kids from both sides of the um, fence come together and make stuff. Uh, this is one in uh, Egypt, in Giza. And at the last round of the Morsi riots, we called really concerned whether they were OK. And the really funny response was they laughed and said, oh, it's a great day, because the bright invent of kids who have no interest in sectarian conflict took it as a day off to go work in the lab. Um, uh, this is one in Barcelona. This was run by artists, architects, and designers who felt like the engineers weren't doing engineering right. And so one of their biggest projects was rapid prototyping full size to make a solar house for the European Solar Decathlon where they looked at how you make playhouses in the fab lab and said, why don't we make a house that way? And so they made the solar house, including all of the furniture, as a giant direct right rapid prototyping project. So what's come out of that project is this is Vicente Gallart, who started that lab. He's now Barcelona's uh, architect. He's now the city planner for Barcelona. And the connection there is Barcelona has amazing design sense. You know, if you look at Sagrada, Gaudi's Sagrada Familia, he clearly didn't subcontract engineering. He, he did amazing stuff figuring out how you build these structures. Yet there's over 50% youth unemployment. So you, you think there's issues here. There, 50% youth unemployment. A whole generation can't work. And so what's happening in Barcelona is once a year all these fab labs meet. Uh, this summer it was in Barcelona. We brought 50 countries there. And the city, each of these is one of the districts in Barcelona. And they're setting up a fab lab in each district in the city as part of the urban infrastructure. So the idea is you should be able to produce what you consume. Uh, they view IKEA as the enemy. IKEA far away divines taste. Far away, make stuff for you in flat packs it and ships it. You go to a big box store to get it. You know, once you have access to the tools, you can make anything you could buy in IKEA locally. And so in turn, that led to this amazing event. This is Barcelona's mayor. And at the meeting, he's pushing a button, starting a 40-year countdown to self-sufficiency. So it's not protectionism. They want to be globally connected for knowledge. But the way they think about it is Barcelona today is a product to trash conversion device. Ships come in at the harbor with products and containers from far away. Trash trucks go out to trash dumps, and it sort of turns one into the other. What they want to do now is be globally connected for knowledge, but locally, so the bits come and go, but the atoms stay. They want to locally produce and uh, 
recycle everything. So it starts with uh, consumer products and stuff like that, but progresses to um, uh, food and energy and use digital fabrication for kind of a new notion of urban self-sufficiency to produce everything they consume rather than being at the end of long supply chains. Um, so in turn, this is a mobile fab lab we set up. And uh, earlier this year, we brought it to the White House. And what's going on in this picture is actually larger than it looks. Um, remember, Wang, Prime, and Data General all failed. In the same sense, there's a lot of discussion of advanced manufacturing today that assumes manufacturing is done by million dollar machines in big factories and looks at do it yourself and personal fabrication as toys. And the real point of this event is, um, along with President Obama, this is his science advisor, John Holdren, and these are the physicists in Congress. The point of this event was shining a light um, that this is bigger than that. Our mobile lab was literally just outside the Oval Office, that even if you have a White House badge, you're not allowed to go there. It's one of the most sensitive places at the White House. And we brought our lasers and big machines. Security was going crazy. But Obama loved it because this is saying, this is really a new economic engine. These aren't just toys. This is a new way to think about economic activity and livelihood. Advanced manufacturing isn't just big companies in the same way that uh, personal computing created entirely new industries. So Bill Foster has bills in the House and Senate to do something similar to what Barcelona did. I'm United States Congressman Bill Foster, and I'm one of the few members of the United States House of Representatives who was a scientist before entering politics. So I often tell people that I represent about one third of the strategic reserve of physicists in Congress. But when I came into work each day in physics, my first stop often wasn't to my office computer or some meeting, but to the laboratory machine shop to check on the progress of some parts that I designed for an experiment or for part of an accelerator. So I can think that, I believe I can safely say that I'm the only member of the United States Congress that knows how to program numerically controlled machine tools. I'm proud to announce that I recently introduced legislation in the United States House of Representatives which supports the goals and mission of the National Fab Lab Network as in the best interests of our people and the best interests of promoting the goals of greater science and technical education, greater access to research and production tools, and empowerment of individuals to understand and use technology to improve their lives. You can think of the NFLN as a new kind of national lab in the United States that's a cloud laboratory, a national network of connected local labs. I've been lucky to have the chance to visit Neil and see the progenitor. So this was written in a very interesting way. It, it's chartering it, which is the same way the post office or Little League got started. It's not spending money. It's identifying it as being in the national interest as something that can be done as a public-private partnership. Instead of a national lab being a billion-dollar facility far away, it's to make a connected network of local labs. Any one of these sites doesn't know enough to do what I'm describing, but the network does. With a network of them, you can. So in turn, uh, this has gotten so big, it's way beyond an outreach project from my lab. And so we've spun off a fab foundation to provide operational capacity. And one of the kickoff to that is Chevron made a $10 million commitment against that bill to set up labs and communities where it works, where there's a virtuous circle of outreach into the community, empowering technical education, and then self-identifying the most inventive, creative people. One of the things it, it, that really powers this is them. So uh, this is Hans Christian in an Arctic village uh, uh, in the top of Norway and came to the lab. I gave him a few demonstration projects, and next time I saw him, he made a robotic truck designing the PCB and the motor controllers and the body and the display. It, probably most of you can't do all of that. Um, this is Chapiso. She was at a fab lab in essentially an apartheid era uh, shantytown township in Africa, and she was doing the work of my how to make class at MIT. And these people talk about innovation, but these bright, innovative kids typically don't fit. They, 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 they fall out of stifling formal schools and limiting jobs. And so they were 
they would come into the lab, get empowered, but fall off a cliff. And so we started a project called the Fab Academy to continue their education. And the way this works is students have peers in labs with work groups, with mentors and machines locally, and then we connect them globally by video and content sharing. And so you can think of MIT in computing terms as being like a mainframe. You go there and get processed. And the whole thing is based on scarcity. You assume books are scarce, people are scarce, space is scarce, tools are scarce, and so we take a few thousand people. It, it works, but doesn't scale. Uh, I don't like MOOCs, massive online classes, because in computing terms, the model there is like time sharing. Uh, you're a terminal, you're staring at a screen, and there's some, a remote educational hub that you're plugged into to get knowledge. The, the Fab Academy works much more like the internet. The internet beat BitNet because it's a scalable distributed network, not a centrally managed network. And so this is based on education in work groups with peers and mentors locally, and then connected in global networks. Um, right now we're using it to teach digital fabrication, like the MIT rapid prototyping class. We're now developing a second class for it, a biotech class called How to Grow Almost Anything, which is using fab labs to make bio labs and then teach biofabrication. So in turn, the next meeting of all these labs is coming back to Boston uh, next August with MIT hosting with the cities of Boston and Somerville and Cambridge. Then the year after that, we're going to China. And I, uh, earlier this week, I was in China. I just came back from Shenzhen. Uh, this is maybe my favorite place on Earth. This is the SEG market in Shenzhen. Um, th this is where much of the technical stuff in this room came from. So in the SEG market, it comes from Shenzhen, but in Shenzhen, there's, you go in this little unassuming door, you come in and there's about 10 floors, and to start, you can buy things like uh, Samsung phones, or I don't know if you can see it, but this is an IPHCNE phone, an iPhone, um, or a Ganachkanang phone. Um, and they make all of this stuff there, but what's, what's really interesting then is you start going in the, and there are these little stalls. So here's one with clips and there's one with heat sinks and here's one with RF connectors and one with PCBs. Um, and this is for your last minute pick and place part needs. But what's interesting is you can buy these, but each one of these is a tip of an iceberg of a factory. So you, you can come in here and pick up an iPhone PCB if you need one but you can get one or 10 or 100 or 1,000 or a million of them. Each one of these is backed up by a factory with essentially arbitrary capacity to produce anything you see here. And so this is amazing infrastructure to make stuff. But there's a but, which is they can see the end coming. Digital fabrication kills this model because you don't need Shenzhen to make it for you. You make it in Barcelona or Savannah but you still need the technical feedstocks. And so there's this amazing mixing of do-it-yourself manufacturing, meeting mass manufacturing, where the role of places like Shenzhen becomes not making your phone, but making the building blocks that let you be able to make your phone. Um, so the Industrial Revolution started in Manchester and then left. This is a Manchester fab lab, and each of these are entrepreneurs creating businesses out of the Manchester Fab Lab. Once you've invented something like this, you can go off to Shenzhen and have them mass manufacture it. But the more interesting model is you can go to market by shipping data and produce products on demand. And so if you had Fab Labs in uh, Savannah, they could send you their designs and you produce it here, or, or designs from anywhere in the world, or you design here and ship it out and produce it anywhere in the world. And so, Go, the ability to go to market and produce on demand doesn't replace mass manufacturing, but what it does is reduce mass manufacturing to the boring stuff. You mass manufacture things where everybody needs the same thing, like nuts and bolts, but things where people differ, where there's more content, there's more value and more personalization, you produce at lower rates on smaller scales locally in just the same way that your inkjet printer 
Huge numbers of pages are printed on inkjet printers, but they're all different. Any one is slow, the total set of them is large. It doesn't make sense to have a workgroup printer on your desk because every printer, every page you produce is different. So this doesn't replace mass manufacturing, but it makes viable tiers that didn't exist before. Um, this was a fab lab in Denmark on a community scale that added up 1,000 jobs and 300 million euros in turnover just out of one of these community labs uh, done that way. Uh, uh, PCAS, the President's Council of Science Advisors, identified a shortfall of a million STEM students for our economy. But beyond that, if you look at, this is employment versus time for, um, this is college grads, um, associate degrees, and this is uh, high school grads. And we have this big shortfall in STEM education, but not just that, the economy is diverging, and a big chunk of the population is diverging entirely from the economy. And what's emerging from this is really a revisiting the whole notion of not just education, but work. If anybody can make anything. The kids getting excited in fab labs are doing STEM education, but it's something much cooler. They're making cool stuff. I usually, I cringe when I hear words like STEM or innovation, because they're usually lack of STEM and lack of innovation. What's rate limiting is providing access to the capabilities. But in turn, when you think about manufacturing, you think about this. But what's emerging is what looks like this. And it scales in the same way personal computers scale. PCs don't replace mainframes, but have significantly narrowed the role of mainframes in the same way personal fabrication doesn't replace mass manufacturing, but significantly narrows its role. But in turn, there's an even bigger implication, which is we want jobs, but why do we want jobs? You want jobs so you get money. So you, you leave home to go to a place you don't want to be, doing something you don't want to do, designing something by somebody you'll never meet to make something for you'll never see, to then get money to then be able to go buy something. What if you could just make something? <laughs> so again, it doesn't apply to everything, but the whole notion of employment and work changes if anybody can make anything. I thought the technology to do that was the hard thing. We're finding that's the easy thing. The hard thing is, if anybody can make anything anywhere, how we set up aid, education, employment, play, all of those things break. And the hard thing is building organizational capacity. So all of the stuff about national fab lab networks and fab foundations and fab academies are because we found the incumbent organizations were failing us. And what was rate limiting was building the organizational capacity. So inventing how you live, work, and play in that world, that's the grand project. That's the really hard project. The goal of fab labs is to obsolete themselves technically, with labs making labs. What's going to live on is, is the equivalent of this new notion of an internet of literal physical things of how you live, work, and play. So background here, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs>